There we go. Okay. Hi, I'm Greg, and I am a maintainer of USB, and running development kernels causes this to happen. And you lost my USB. Did you lose my video, too? There we go. Nope. Okay. Yeah, video is good. All right. Greg. It's good. Okay. Um, let's talk about maintainers and getting your patches accepted. Um, I did this talk. I did this talk as, as this. Um, title as well sometimes. I don't really want your code. Um, I'm going to talk about why maintainers um, don't want your code and what, what you can do to make sure that they accept it. Uh, the big thing is when a maintainer accepts your code, then they ex take responsibility for it. So you have to make it very easy for somebody to be willing to accept responsibility for work that you've done. And I'm going to talk about what we go through and what we do as far as maintainers and what you can do as developers. So this is the Size of the kernel, um, as of the last release, 5.9, which was about four weeks ago, well, no, seven, two months ago. Um, and we're at 70,000 files, 30 million lines of code. Now, um, please remember, you don't run all of this. You run a tiny subset. My laptop runs about 2 million lines of code. Your phone runs about 3.5, 4 million lines of code. Um, but the entirety of the kernel, all the drivers, all the architectures, everything is together in one big, giant source code. Uh, one big tree. So this is the size, but this isn't the size of what you run. So that's very, people get confused about it, thinking it's getting huge and bloated. It isn't. This is the size of overall. If you look at the size of what your laptop's been running for the past couple of years, it's been pretty much the same. This is the amount of developers we had last year, um, at least 450 companies. I haven't updated my number um, of how, how many people are actually how many companies are participating? I need to go do that, um, but this is about it. So we are the we know we are the largest software development project out there with number of different developers from different companies out there. Um, it's huge. This is a giant, giant group of people. Nobody works for anybody else. We all contribute and we all contribute to um, make things better for ourselves. And that's fine because it works out for everybody that way. Um, this is our rate of change. I like showing this. Um, it isn't that bad. It's kind of not unusual until you look at the units. And this is what happens every day. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, this is what goes into the kernel. This is average over the whole release cycle, but it's huge. We're going very, very quickly, very, very fast. Um, but we're used to this. This is what we've been doing for a long time. And in fact, um, we keep going a little bit faster. This is the number of changes that are happening per hour. Um, this number, the Linux Foundation tells me not to say scary, but every year I'm like, there's no way we can go faster than this, and we do. So go faster than this. If you look at the 5.8 release, we're up to almost 11 changes an hour. Um, this is very quick. This is very fast. This is a huge, huge development project that's moving very quickly. And you need to remember that when you try to participate with it. And you need to remember this if you try and not participate, if you want to stay away from it, and you want to try and keep your changes outside the kernel. If you graph this over time, over the number of years we've had, um, it slowly goes up. It's Kind of plateaus but it has been going up every year um, every time so this means please always remember that if you take a one year worth of development cycle from two years ago and then look at one year worth of development this year we did more work so if you kept your code outside the tree you will have more work to try and do to catch up to us it is in your interest to catch up and merge with us and participate with us in the community otherwise you will get further behind faster and i don't think you want to do that um, that's it. So let's talk about how we do this really quickly. Like we said, we have 4,500 different developers. They make a single change and then they want to contribute it. So what do they do? They turn it into a patch. That's a very a small text file and they email it. <laughs> we still work with email because of our huge rate and a huge number of people are doing it. Tools like GitHub, tools like um, Garrett just do not work for us. They don't scale properly. And those people, they all send the patch or the change off to the owner of that file or the maintainer of that subsystem. Um, every single patch or every single line in the kernel can be traced to who maintains it. We have a tool. You run the tool on your, on your um, patch, and then it says, OK, you need to mail it to this person, this person, and this mailing list. They email it off. Those people review it. They accept it. Or they reject it. They push it back. And then those people, if they accept it, then that passes off onto the subsystem maintainer. Now, for those drivers and file maintainers, we have about 700 or 800, I think, now listed in the kernel. There's that many different individual owners of different parts of the kernel. 
And then those people push them off of the subsystem maintainers. And these are things for like USB, PCI, um, TTY layer, memory management, a specific architecture, specific subsystem that way, networking. And these people all have public trees. And these public trees, they're listed in the maintainers file in the kernel. And then they accept the patches. And then those public trees are published every day. And then um, we have tools. We have automatic testing tools that suck from all these trees. They test everything. They give us feedback. And um, you can see whether your change has been accepted or not. And that's how things work. And at the subsystems, we have about 150, 200 maybe different subsystem maintainers, if that. But there's about that many different trees out there. And all these trees every single day get pulled into something called Linux Next. And Linux Next is done by Stephen Rothwell in, um, in Australia. And um, he takes all these and merges them all together and then reports on conflicts because we do modify things in other subsystems. A perfect example is some IRQ handling stuff just got changed so it broke a dri driver in one of my subsystems because I didn't have those related changes. We get notified of this, it tests it, it builds it, it boots it, and it runs on tons of different architectures. Andrew Morton, I kind of put over on the side here because he scoops up files and subsystems that nobody really is maintaining, nobody lists. Um, he takes all those and those go into Linux next as well. And this happens every single day. So the patches again start from the developer, go to the driver file maintainer, go to the subsystem maintainer, go to Linux next. And Linux next is if you want to see what is going to happen to the next kernel, run Linux next. If you want to get involved in the kernel, run Linux next. See what is happening there. If you have build problems, if you have warnings that are showing up, if it doesn't boot properly, let us know. Because as developers and maintainers, it all works good for us, but if it doesn't work good for you, we don't know to fix it. So look there. If you were a developer and want to get involved, work off of either the subsystem tree or Linux Next tree, because that is all includes all the work that's already been done. You can't work off of Linus's tree because it doesn't include all this work that's been done by all the developer community at that point in time. Excuse me. Always work off of Linux Next. Okay, after that, um, when the release window opens up, and I'm, I give other talks on how we do releases and such not, but basically at the release window, all the subsystem maintainers send stuff to Linus, and we send it all directly. We don't say Linus does not pull from next. We have to individually call out what we want to send to Linus. And we do that so that if there are problems, Linus doesn't get them. He doesn't automatically pull everything in. There's things that stage in Andrew's tree, there's things that stage in a number of my trees that we just don't, aren't ready to go to Linus. Sometimes a whole subsystem isn't ready. I had one time that when the TTY layer, um, some core changes were not working well. They kind of worked, they didn't, there were still enough problems. The merge window opened up. I said, I'm gonna skip this merge window, send all Linus a bunch of bug fixes, and we'll take this next uh, on the next cycle in another three months. If Linus was pulling directly from next, he would have gotten all those problems. That's a much better, it's a push. We explicitly ask him to do something and it works out much better than automatically happening. Um, this is what we do. This is what happens every single day, every single release cycle, and all the time. This is how we get things done. Um, are there any questions? I think I can kind of see questions. Maybe not. No open questions. Awesome. No hands raised? Okay, that's easy. Um, going on. I like showing this for a number of different reasons. This is the top developers by quantity, not necessarily quality, but for the last year, these are people who've done a lot of work. And I wanna call out, so Christian Will, Chris Wilson's um, graphics, Chris, Christoph Helwig, file systems and block layer, Maro, video for Linux, Takashi Sound, Andy is a graphics, um, you and Colin and Geert and Gustavo, I wanna specifically call out because these people are going through the whole kernel tree, finding common problems and fixing. They're janitorial work, they're low level, um, people would think of it as um, not very glamorous work. It is very, very important for us. This work is required by a kernel, by, it's required by a code base, especially a code base that wants to survive, that it gets a constant maintenance, a constant update. Colin goes through and fixes spelling fixes that get added. He updates his spelling fix tool and pushes out a bunch more. Geert fixes up tons and tons of um, quality, uh, tiny little fixes based on different things. Gustavo, tons of really good. He finds a security pattern that's pointed out by Coverity, fixes the whole kernel tree with all those issues. It works out really, really well. Um, that's a very common thing. It's a project, it shows that a project is mature, a project is very active, and it is required. And we also really appreciate, we want that kind of work. So if you want to get involved, do these janitorial 
patches, do this type of work, and we'll gladly take it. This is something we really need. This is, gives you a sense of what people do in about a year with their time, and also gives you a sense of um, where things are being changed. Um, to look at maintainers, we talk about uh, maintainers sign off when they review something. So um, David Miller does networking and um, a few other subsystems, um, Spark, IDE, scoops up patches and reviews them. I do a lot of staging, drivers, and other stuff. Alex uh, um, does graphics, I think. Mark does sound. Mauro does video for Linux. Linus and Andrew. So Andrew sends all patches to Linus in email form. So Linus reviews them and applies them and applies a lot of other stuff. But Linus also doesn't apply patches, or he, he takes merges directly from other people, but he doesn't review them all. And that's the point I want to try and make here. If you look back at our old, uh, this old link, the people below are, um, once a maintainer accepts a file or accepts a change, they are now responsible for this. So every point along the way, you add your name to it. So I take it from a USB serial driver maintainer who takes it from a person who submitted the patch. We all have our name on it. So now we are responsible for it. And that's signed off by, and we need to take those things into consideration. So you, when you send something to us, we have to know that you'll be around to fix it. And that's the most important thing. I don't necessarily trust that the people underneath me who send me stuff all the time got it right always, but I know they'll be there when they get it wrong because we all get it wrong sometimes. Just that's the key. You need trust. It's a human interaction. It's a relationship thing. So when you're starting out, it's hard to build up trust. And it's also because of that, it's really hard to change core parts of the kernel because it requires that us to trust you that you got it right, basically. So coding style and other fixes are very easy to take and very easy to accept. Core changes in the kernel are harder to get in because we need to trust that you're going to be around to fix these when you get it wrong. We've had examples where people have abused our trust, abused our trust in the networking subsystem. Most recently, an academic tried to abuse our trust by sending us cleanup fixes for error paths and actually tried to inject errors and inject code into the kernel that was bad. That was not good. We caught that. But don't abuse our trust <laughs> because if you abuse our trust, we, we will not like you. We will, we will blacklist you and you now are not allowed to work on the kernel. So um, these people, maintainers, we review this code and then we're now responsible for it. So maintainers, uh, David Miller gives a great quote, um, we're like an editor. We do, um, I'll talk a little bit more about that. We, we were developers in the past. We know how to review code. We tell other people, we say, this looks good. This doesn't look good. Why don't you go do this instead? And by average, we accept about one third of all changes that are sent to us. So if you look at our rate of change and look at how fast things are accepted, realize two thirds more code is out there being submitted to us. Now, sometimes it's just the same patch set over and over and over, but most of the times it's just, um, it takes like two or three times to get the code accepted, but that takes review, that takes development. That is a lot of effort out there that's happening that you don't see in the accepted amount of code that's being merged. So also don't get, um, don't, get discouraged when we don't accept code right away because we want to make sure that you can be around. We want to make sure that things are right and that you can accept change and that you can modify things. So these are different subsystems that you'll see kind of common. Um, again, Jens, Expo for Block, Martin for SCSI. Um, these are kind of areas of the kernel that change a lot. This happens how we do this for the past year. So um, who's funding this work? Um, we didn't do an article. We didn't do a, um, John Corbett and I from Linux Weekly News didn't really do a, um, a paper last year, but this is the last year's worth of work. Amateurs did about 13% of work, and these are people that we know they don't work for anybody or we don't know who they work for. Um, those people normally do not do more than five changes. Anything more than five changes, we know who you work for. It's that simple. Um, and anything more than five changes, you can get a job, usually, if you do real contributions. Intel, 11%. This is not that many patches. This is about um, 10,000. No, sorry. 12, ah, I got to look it up. Maybe 1,000 patches from Intel. Red Hat, AMD, Huawei, Google, Lenaro, Sousa, consultants. Some people work for other companies. A lot of embedded people do work for other companies, and those are consultants. Um, Mellanox, Renee Assist, Arm, Oracle. There's Nobody really unusual in here. Linux Foundation, um, that's kind of, is a little bit unusual in that there's only four of us <laughs> doing this work and we're still in the top 10 or top 20. So it is possible. Canonical, I will call out, there's really pretty much two <laughs> Canonical employees that are doing kernel work um, and they get in the top 20. So it is possible to do a lot of good work and have your company in the top 20 list. Um, it's not unusual for that. 
Um, yeah. Um, any questions about this so far? That was pretty fast. Anything open questions, comments? Hey, okay, that's easy. Um, let's talk about the development process. So I talk about the development process in a way that is common to hardware people. Hardware people create a design, they emulate it, they simulate it, they tape out, power on, you integrate it, then you finally bring up the operating system and you ship the device. Um, this is very common for making a chip, making a device, um, things like that. Um, when you're creating a software product, it's also can be staged along this way before you finally make something public. This is a very common thing. Now, if you submit the code to us and send stuff to us, it takes us a while to review it. It takes us a while to get back to you. You have to revise it and submit it again. Then our release cycles every three months get it merged. It takes a little while to do that. Um, that's how um, it takes a while to get things merged. So ideally, you want to submit your code really, really early in the process. You, if you submit your code really early in the process, your code can be accepted before your actually chip is spit out there and as public. And some companies know how to do this really, really well. Other companies do not know how to do this really well. And they are very late to the game. They wait until their chip actually ships and that they're using an older kernel. They have to go back and take the time to catch up, stuff, uh, get stuff out to the community and it wastes time. This is the ideal situation. A number of companies, I will call out Intel, I will call out IBM, know how to do this really, really well. Sony's gotten really good at this as well. Um, they, Intel and both IBM have had code in the kernel before chips are even hit um, tape out. Um, I, Intel is, is known for having code in the kernel before chips even ship and they have canceled projects where we've had to remove code from the kernel for something that never actually shipped. Um, we don't like to ever remove anything from the kernel if anybody's using it, but if nothing is actually shipped, we don't, we'll gladly remove it. Um, this is the key. This is a proper way to do it. It's also faster. It saves you time, it saves you money, and it's documented this way. Both IBM and Intel have publicly said, if you work upstream, we'll save you time and money. So this is the fastest way for you as a company to get involved and do this work. It makes sense. Um, it takes a while to get there, but it will save you time and money. It's a business case to work with the community. Again, like I said, if you, you look at how much work we do in the past year, the year before that, we did less. So we are actually, if you stay out of the tree for longer, you have more work to catch up with and it's harder to do that. So it's a difficult task. Please work with us, work with us as developers. We want your stuff. We also want your changes and we want your stuff because um, everybody contributes to the kernel in a selfish way you're solving your own problems. And that's fine because it turns out everybody has the same problems. Um, we had numerous examples of this over the years where somebody said, no, this is only special to our market. And it turns out, no, it works for everybody. Um, contribute to the kernel in your selfish way. We'll gladly accept it because it turns out everybody is unique and special just like everybody else, as the old quote goes. So please, we gladly take your work. So how do you do this? Um, again, Dave Miller said we are editors, like in the publish industry, we used to be writers, we used to be programmers, so we know how things work. We know how to review stuff, we tell you what to do, we try and guide you on the way to get your code in. This is our job as a maintainer. Our job is to help you out. We want to help you out, but don't make it hard for us to help you out. Um, that's the key thing. Um, I went through my patch inbox um, a number of years ago. Actually, no, this one, I went through it a couple weeks ago, and in the two weeks, I received 1,400 patches to review. Um, that's a lot. <laughs> that's a lot of patches to review. This is my normal workload. So realize when you submit patches to people that they're not gonna respond to you instantly. Give them two weeks to respond. Um, then you can ask them nicely if they haven't. Um, but realize that people are working on other things at the same time. I have other projects to work on. There's lots of other patches out there. The best way to help a patch process go is to review other people's code. Please help, I would love to help with reviewing these patches. Um, I have some sub maintainers, I have some co-maintainers, we all do work on this and we help out, but having developers review other people's patches is the key to do this stuff. Um, but here's, the, in that two week process period, I had a number of things that were just really, really wrong. And here's an example of things I got. So I got um, one patch that said subject, that was patch 48 out of 48. There was no other 47 patches anywhere. We had no idea what was going on. This actually is a very, very common error. Uh, Git makes it very easy to do this. 
um, please watch out. Don't do this. Um, look at your email before you send it out because I'm going to be say, searching around trying to find your 47 other patches and get very confused because they're not there. Um, best one, I also got uh, 15 patches in a series. We want patches in a series to show you your work in a specific order and break things down into one little logical change per thing. That's wonderful. That's great. But there was no order given. So I had no idea what to apply in what order. Um, I, you can't rely on email date and timestamps. It will fail. It just did not work. Um, please order them properly. Um, I got patches number one and number three through 10. I had no idea where the other ones were. Um, that's not all good as well. Don't. If you're gonna copy me on a patch series, I want to see them all because you want me to review them all. You can't ask me to review things out of order. Um, I had a signed off by in the signature, which is down at the bottom that was automatically stripped out. That's not gonna just work at all. That's obvious and our tools should catch that for you. We had the best, these happen like weekly. Um, if your email signature says that the email is confidential, I have to instantly delete it because kernel patches are not confidential. You want us to accept this in the public and to accept this under the license that we have, it can't be confidential, it's that simple. Fix your email client, fix your corporate email to do that. You'll see this is why a number of companies have an email box in the corner and they send out email through that Linux server. IBM, Intel, Microsoft are infamous for having their little Linux dot domain for their email out there. Red Hat, people work around the Red Hat systems as well. You can't send me email that says it's confidential. Um, tabs convert to spaces. That's a very white space. That's a very common thing. If you ever try and send a patch through a web client, it just doesn't work. Please do not do that. That will not work. Um, leading spaces removed. This is also a common thing for web clients. If you cut and paste with a mouse, leading spaces are removed, patches don't apply. White space actually matters. Um, there's a different non-unified format, which is really interesting. It's kind of hard to do that these days. Um, this is from the 1990s style. Um, it's very hard to read for those of us. Um, please don't do that. That didn't work. Um, patch was created in a subdirectory way down the kernel tree. That didn't work as well. You have to create it at the root. Doesn't work. Um, this was funny. Uh, people are still using a really old kernel, <laughs> somebody. Um, it looked like it was in there running and it says root. Um, I don't know how they even created this patch, but they did. Um, and send it out. Um, please, that didn't work. That's a kernel from about 10 years ago. Um, made against a different tree. That's a very common thing. You make it against a tree that I don't maintain, and then I can't take your patches because they just don't apply. That just does not work at all. You have to at least send patches to the person who events their tree that they um, can take. It just is that simple. In the kernel, we have some um, tools that'll help you out with that, and I'll talk a little bit more about that again in a minute. Uh, wrong coding style. We have a coding style. You might not like our coding style, but the, the main reason for having a coding style is to be consistent. And you want a consistent coding style so that we all can read it easily and then we can all modify your code. You want me to be able to read your code. I want you to be able to read mine. This is the key. We have tools that catch this stuff, run them, and use it. It's that simple. Um, the best was I, somebody admitted they had a wrong coding style and they acknowledged it and they thought that their little tiny driver was more important than the 30 million lines of the rest of the kernel code. That's not true. That just isn't going to work out. Please don't do that ever again. Wouldn't compile. I see this a lot. People send me patches that if I try and build it, it just fails. Um, that's really rude. It kind of shows that you didn't even test build this stuff, let alone test run it. Some, a lot of driver changes and stuff you can't run because you don't have the hardware, but at least build the code. Um, because if you break the build, no patch can ever break the build. And we don't like that. It won't work. Um, it broke the build on patch three out of six and tried to keep on going and then I fixed it in the last one. Well, that just doesn't work. Um, you have to, every single patch that you submit to us has to stand alone on its own in order is fine, but you can't break the build and then fix it up later. We have tools that every single patch that's committed to the Linux kernel, all 10 of those an hour, they all build the whole thing. Nothing breaks. It all works. That's our requirement. It's a good engineering process and it works really well, so you can't do this. If, um, the best was you, somebody broke the build on patch five of eight of a different patch series, and then they said that they'll fix, send me the patch later to fix it up. Uh, it doesn't matter, nobody's gonna use this. That's not okay, you, can't, you cannot do that stuff at all. Um, a lot of people send me patches that have nothing to do with me. Um, that's nice, I can't really do anything with them, but um, I appreciate it, I don't think it's spam, but I'm not gonna be able to do much with them. Send them to the right people. We have tools for this stuff. It works out well. 
um, some people send one giant patch and that's really, really hard. For, this isn't actually that big. I've seen much bigger than this. Um, but reading 5,000, 4,500 lines of code at once to try and see what's going on does not work. The goal of the kernel is to um, follow your old math professor's rules of show your work. Break things down one tiny logical step at a time. Please do that. That's a requirement. Don't send me giant things all at once. Sometimes you can send a whole driver, and that's fine. A whole file for a driver, that's one thing. But in this case, it was not that. It was just one giant change of all this different stuff. That's not okay. Um, we have kernel doc formats to do the documentation. Something somebody said was obviously wrong. Um, that was just really weird. Um, I understand people like using other document formats, but we have one. Don't try and use Java doc or anything else. Use ours. Wait, it's documented. And if you run the build of testing it, it'll actually tell you errors and you have to fix it. Um, and like I say, this was actually a calm two weeks. Um, this was nothing really major going on. This is what me as a maintainer have to see all the time. Um, so that gives you a sense of what being a reviewer of the kernel gets. And this is why we have a lot of stuff. This is why we have rules. We have processes in place. And all these processes are documented. We document them really, really well. Um, these slides are going to be available online, so you can see the link um, to these. But these are in our kernel tree. Um, they're published on the web in our documentation. We have a checklist. Go down the checklist. Say, did I do this, 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 this? Yes, great. You can send it off. We have submitting drivers. We have submitting patches. These are documents that you should read. It explains everything that you want. And if you do something wrong that's not in this list, in these files, that's fine. We'll tell you. And if you do what's here, we're very, very happy. All those things I mentioned earlier that happened wrong this past two weeks were listed in here as things you should not do or things that had to do it right. So we have this stuff documented. Please, please follow this stuff. So um, any questions so far? I've been going pretty fast. It looks like um, should the build be tested against all architectures before submitting the patch? Um, no. Build it against yours. Um, usually it's pretty obvious if it will or will not break. Uh, we have tools when you submit patches to the mailing list that will build on all architectures, but I don't expect you to always get it right. I don't do it. I build it for x86 and ARM, and that's about it. So I wouldn't worry too much about that. Um, and yes, the links in the test cannot be clicked um, because the presentation has it. So don't worry about that. Um, I have a link to the presentation in the beginning of this, and it'll be on the website for this as well. Um, any other questions? Can you ask for life cycle? The life cycle of what? I don't understand. Kernel life cycle of kernel releases. Um, I have a whole presentation on how kernel releases are done. What we do in that, um, I'd recommend going and seeing that. Um, it's on my website. It's on um, my GitHub account. Kernel development. I gave one. I give this talk about every couple months. Um, please go see that. It's, it's a little bit outside this scope of this talk. Okay. Um, thank you. And anything else? All right. I got more time. I got more stuff. Um, first time contributor. Also, yes, we have lots of stuff, places to start. I have a presentation on where to start. Um, kernel newbies. Um, there's a whole directory in the kernel, driver staging that has to do files. Look at those files, read what's in there, submit a patch. She has written a whole presentation, a whole course on how to submit your first kernel patch. Go through that. Go through that. That's a really, really good one. It's on the Linux Foundation site um, somewhere. Um, that's the best thing of how to get involved and how to make your first patch, how to get accepted. Works out really well. There's also a link on the kernel newbie site to uh, um, documentation on how to do it there as well. So I recommend those. OK. So like I said before, um, it's in my self-interest to ignore your patch. Because if I send, if you send me stuff, then I have to maintain it. I have to accept it. I am now responsible for it. If you disappear, I have to um, take it. It's not, it doesn't really work. So I have to be, I have to know that you're going to either get it right or be there to fix it when I get it wrong. Um, so if I do accept your patch, 
you have to give me no excuses. I have to be obviously foolish not to accept your patch. So if you go through all the things and follow all the rules that we have, it's foolish to me not to accept your patch because you did everything right. You fixed a problem. You made something work for you that um, you need to have solved, that, that you want to have working. So I have to have no excuse to reject your patch. Give me no excuse. And it's really easy not to do that. Um, just follow those rules. And then when you do that, you've given me code that's properly formatted, submitted in the correct way, build properly, um, I have to take your patch. I, I, I have no excuses and I will. Um, if I do take a patch or if I, I do, if you do send me stuff, I will promise to do this for you because it's a two way street as a maintainer. I am responsible for things like this. I try and review patches within one to two weeks. Not all maintainers do this. We have jobs, we have other things we have to do. Um, some corporations, most corporations do not allow their maintainers to do maintainership work on company time which is nice, so these people do it on their own time. So realize that for the majority, like huge, huge majority of all maintainers, this is not their paid job. This is what they do on their own because they, they feel responsible for the kernel. Their company almost always pays them to do new kernel work, not to maintain old stuff. It's slowly, slowly changing. But if you look in the maintainer's file, you'll see a list of who says actually paid and who isn't paid to do that. There's some huge companies that list their maintainers as not being paid to do this work. But I try and do it within one to two weeks because I am kind of paid to do this for the Linux Foundation, um, except during the merge window. During the merge window, you'll get a response from me saying, I got to wait till the after the merge window is over. But um, then I'll get to it and I catch up within three weeks. It takes a little time. Um, and submit something. If I haven't um, done anything within two weeks, I have no problem with you emailing me and say, hey, what's up with this patch? And it isn't, don't feel bad about this. Don't feel upset. Just do it. I don't feel bad about it. It's like, oh, I'll feel, I feel upset that I haven't reviewed it in that time. Please do that. I also will, if you send me patches, offer semi-constructive criticism. I will not just reject things without telling you why. I'll tell you what to do, how to make this things better, how to make it acceptable, or I'll just take a patch. But I will offer constructive criticism on that stuff. I will also let you know the status of your patch because people want to know what's going on. Um, a lot of people run patchwork and their subsystems run on that. USB is one that uh, patchwork runs automatically. So when I accept patches, it automatically shows that the patch has been accepted and where it is. Um, you also get email notifications from some maintainers. Um, Andrew Morton first did this. I've copied his scripts. A number of other maintainers have copied them. So when your patch is accepted, you'll get an email saying where it is, where you can find it, what the next steps are going to be. Uh, once the maintainer accepts it, usually your hands off. You don't have to worry about it unless something really goes wrong. Um, but I will let you know the status. And you can always email me. And I'll point you at where it is. And you can follow along where it's going through the process. Through the public trees, you can see where it is. Um, and throughout all of this, um, the goal of us working in public is because it creates a better product. Um, Jason, who did WireGuard for the kernel, said this to me in text many, many years ago. Um, the reason we do this work and the reason you, you do this is um, in public is so terrifying to submit things that it's going to be reviewed by somebody else, but it makes you do the best possible work that you can possibly do because your name is on it. Your name is a public record now that you submitted this stuff. And you're not anonymous, you're not hidden behind a corporate firewall, you're not hidden buried in some corporate database or some internal server. This is your name in public doing this work. And that's great. And because of that, we get higher quality work, you do higher caliber work, and it works. This is our development process. This is the process that we do. And because it's in public, and because it's all out there for everybody to see, it generates a better thing. And that was it. That was fast. Um, any other questions? Yes, I do I see questions. Okay. Um, are there any devices in QMU that's considered standard by kernel? Must you test it? Um, the best thing to do is test if it works on your machine. If you're working for drivers that are not on your machine, then um, it's a little bit hard to write new code for that. Um, do a build that makes sure that it doesn't break the build. All mod config, um, just make sure that everything works everything that succeeds in building and you can boot your laptop, you can boot your desktop and it can work on the hardware that you are used to. If you break somebody else's hardware, that's usually pretty rare, but you know you're going to do that when you, when you make those changes. Um, accidentally breaking other people's stuff is not a problem. Accidents happen. We take it and we fix it and we move on. Not a big deal. Don't worry about that. That's not something to be too concerned about. At least test build your code though. <laughs> you should always test build your code. Don't send stuff that you obviously haven't at least built it on your desktop or arm or something simple like that. Um, no, 
not relevant to submitting patches. Kernel read writes safely. You're probably, no, I'm not going to get into that. Um, don't read or write kernel files files from within the kernel. I'll say that right now. If you want to discuss that over email, I'll be glad to, but never try and read or write a file from within the kernel. Um, there's also a Linux Week of News article talking about where that's been going and stuff like that. Um, what about new tools for kernel development? I do not know about those tools. Um, there's lots of people, lots of developers. Like we had said, we have 4,500 developers. We all use different tools to create things. So it doesn't really matter what you use to create it. We take patches through email, the least common denominator. It works well for everywhere. Email is actually really, really good, and people don't realize it um, because it's not interrupt-driven. It gives you a chance to see something, to mull it over, to translate it to your native language. As someone who lives in a country where I don't speak the native language, I very am very aware of it ni nice to think, slow things down and be able to translate things to my native language, and be able to respond, and then respond back. Email works very, very well for that. You don't have to instantly respond on IRC. You don't have to instantly respond in a um, meeting. It works really well. Email is a very, very good tool for this. Text is very good for discussing technical issues and technical things, and that's the key. So there are other people trying to do other types of tools. Uh, we All maintainers have tools that we use and scripts that we use, and we copy them and modify them and share them around. For how we manage patches, please use whatever you want for that. Um, if you send a patch, for example, to the Bluetooth, should you use the Bluetooth Next tree? Yes, you should use the Bluetooth Next tree or Linux Next. Usually, either one works out as well. Um, they're usually not an overlap between the two. If you're modifying something in Bluetooth, there shouldn't be another subsystem also modifying Bluetooth that shows up in Linux Next. If there is, we'll catch it really easily. But just work on the tree that is for that subsystem. So for USB, I have a USB tree. Bluetooth has a Bluetooth tree. Work on those trees and submit to there. Very simple. Um, how and when tr people transmit from a role of a maintainer from being a developer. Um, sometimes it is as simple as, oh, you touched this file last. Do you wish to maintain it? Um, as part of the mentor process, um, I had some mentor or mentees this past summer. One of them was modifying and fixing some security bugs in one of the subsystems. Turned out that subsystem was unmaintained. The maintainer of it did not want to do it anymore. And they said, hey, do you wish to maintain it? And the mentee was like, okay, I will maintain it. That's how things happen. You can maintain code if you write it from scratch. If you send me a new driver, now you're the maintainer, tag your it. Um, if you maintain, to maintain a subsystem, it's usually an organic process. You're helping out with a subsystem. The maintainer says, I want to do something else. Hey, do you want to do this instead? And they say yes or no. Some people do not want to be a maintainer because it does take a lot of non-development time. I'm not writing a lot of new patches. David Miller's not writing a lot of new patches. We are switched from a developer to an editor mode. Some, I have some developers and some of my subsystems that could be a great maintainer, but they don't want to be. So I'll do that work for them instead because I'll handle the patches. They just want development, develop stuff. They want to fix bugs and push them out and not have to worry about the patch management stuff. It's a very organic process. I wouldn't worry too much about it. Um, but again, if you want to write a whole new subsystem and submit it, you will be the maintainer for that subsystem automatically by virtue of that happening. Um, somebody wants a su uh, suggestion for writing script.perl. I do not understand that. I'm sorry. Um, all the kernel is in C. There are some Perl scripts for check patch and things like that. Um, but um, if, you will, if you know Perl, please contribute to those. I think we had a maintainer process. Um, there was one project that was taking patches to check patch, which is our tool for managing um, patches to see if they follow our rules. Um, patches accepted by the LTS needs backporting. Who's responsible for the backporting? The maintainers or the original patch author? Um, that's a good question. So when you submit a patch and the developer says this should be backported to older kernels. You can say how far back do you wish for that to be backported to. Um, me as a maintainer of the stable kernels and the LTS kernels, the long-term stable kernels, um, some of them go back many, many years. Sometimes patches do not apply. If they apply easily and I can see that, oh, how to modify them and get them apply, I'll do that my work myself. If not, and you've said this needs to go to a really old kernel, you'll get an email from my system that says, please, if you really want this to go to those old kernels, send me a patch. And that kind of shows that if you do care about those older kernels and you do want it there, you will submit the work. I do have, there's a number of developers who do get those um, acknowledgements and do do the backporting work for us. 
um, you'll see them on the stable uh, mailing list. There's a number of really good developers that help out with that, and I'm really happy to see that. Um, but it's not your responsibility as a developer if you don't want to do that work. As part of the stable process, I never want to add more work for you to do or more work for a maintainer than they want to do. If it's important and it's a big security issue, sometimes I'll do the work. Um, otherwise, if nobody is really wants to do the work, it really probably wasn't that important, so no, it doesn't get backported. It's that simple. Um, simplest subsystem for initial contribution, um, the staging contribu directory. So drivers slash staging. I have a whole talk about this stuff. Um, and again, to do. There's a big list of things to do in there. Submit a coding style fix for in there, and away you go. That part of the kernel is there for new people to get involved. That part of the kernel does not have all the coding style fixes done by us. We could have done it instantly, but we want you to get involved, learn the process, fix your email client, submit it again, learn how things work, and that's the best place to get involved. Do not try and make coding style changes to parts of the kernel outside of there, because that gets in the way of maintainers, it gets them, makes them bother, um, gets things, um, it intrudes on other development that's happening for other subsystems. Just do it in the staging directory, and then you can progress from there. That's the best place to get involved to start with. Back part patches in the same cycle and or a different. There is a different life cycle for stable kernels. I have a talk, different talk about that. Um, stable patches all have to be merged into Linus's tree before they can go into a stable tree. Um, they happen semi-automatically. I talk about how that does, but um, get things into Linus's tree first. That's the requirement. That's the rule. We cannot take things into a stable tree that are not in Linus's tree first. So that's the way that works. Um, get involved. Um, again, standard set of optimization. Da, 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 da. I do not, very rarely will I reject a patch if it hasn't been optimized enough. Very rarely in the kernel are there any areas that performance really, really matters. Um, because most of the time we're dealing with hardware, you're dealing with long latencies, um, it just doesn't matter. Um, performance is, if you can measure it, wonderful, we'll take it. Um, first off, you get it working first. If it works, then we can optimize it because we can see where the hotspots are and go from there. We have very good tools to do performance analysis on the kernel. Um, they're built into the kernel. They work really well. Work on it then. Um, if you slow things down, we will know. Every patch that's submitted to the kernel run through a ton of benchmarks, a ton of tests, and we got automatic emails saying, hey, your patch sped up this benchmark over here by X percent or it slowed it down. Unless we get one of those, we just take the patch. Don't worry too much about optimizations. Worry about getting it right first. If I see something obviously unoptimized, I'll tell you. It's that simple. Don't, I would not worry too much about that. Um, persistent tests is a good way to persist changes with a test framework. We have unit tests. We Shua here on the call. Um, she is a maintainer of the kernel sub test subsystem. Okay, self tests. We have tests. Two types of tests. We have tests where we modify or we test the functionality of the kernel from outside the kernel from user space and those are in the kernel self-test directory, and we have tests that we test from within the kernel, and those use the KUnit subsystem or framework. Um, she was the maintainer of all that stuff. We have the ability to do both. We have some, we have the code in the kernel to do both. Um, please write your tests for either one that makes sense. Um, when we're adding a new system call, it's really good, and it's not a hard requirement, but it's a soft requirement for you to take, um, write a test for that. So like I wrote a new test, a new sub, a new, system call called refile. I wrote a whole bunch of tests for that. And that's exercising that system call from user space. If you write a new functionality for some um, crypto algorithm, we have a whole crypto algorithm self-test subsystem in the kernel that tests it from within the kernel. Those are there. So we have those. Look at what area of the kernel you're working on. They will usually have tests for them already. Go from that. If not, ask the maintainer where they want the test to go. We'll be glad to answer that. How do we handle security patches? Um, the, there's a really good document on the kernel. Um, we have a security document um, that just says how we, the kernel security team will, if you notify us of a security problem, we'll fix it as soon as possible. The kernel treats a, every patch or every bug reported to it as a bug. A bug is a bug is a bug, whether it's security issue or not, because most of the time we don't know if it is security related or not when we fix it. There's lots of instances of famous patches where I've fixed things in code that I've broken, and it turns out three years later, somebody said, oh, that would fix the security bug. So we fix them, we move, push it out, and we move on. We do this every week. We fix security bugs, and we fix known security bugs and unknown security bugs every week. 
the stable patches are taking about 30 to 35 patches a, a day. Um, those are in the stable kernels. Those are patches that we know fix problems. Take those. Um, when you submit patches to us that we know that they fix a bug, we will tag those to go to the stable kernels. They'll get backported and they'll get in the, pro in the pipeline in the way they go. Um, that's how we handle a security patch. We have a document if you have to submit us stuff that you want us to have under embargo, talk to us, the security team on the kernel, but we really don't like embargoes at all longer than a week after we have a fix made. Um, it takes, sometimes it takes us longer than a week to create that fix, but we don't want like sitting on things for very long for obvious reasons, it just doesn't work. Um, Julia says she can boot kernels, oh, did not disappeared. Julia's. That's sorry, I was answering that question, typing answer. <laughs> Okay, sorry. I said that I usually report it to the uh, mailing list. Um, any problem if I don't have time to debug, and uh, so it it should yes. be in the answered list, so you can you okay. can. Oh, fast! Oh, nice. Okay, great. <laughs> um, scroll down some more. Um, what happens if I receive multiple patches solving the same bug? Um, I will show. It. We have multiple patches fixing the same coding style issue. Um, I take the first one that was sent to me. <laughs> it's that simple. Sometimes if you're fixing a problem and multiple people submit a patch for the same problem, it's usually done a little different way. We might argue which one does it better or not. This is actually really rare. It's very rare that this happens. And usually it's first come first serve because that makes, that's the only fair way to do that. Sometimes if uh, somebody like an obvious build warning happens and everybody sends a patch the same day, I will combine them all and they're signed off and um, tested by, by all those people on the patch at the same time. This is rare, I wouldn't worry too much about it. But try and fix it, if you have the same, if you find a bug, fix it as soon as possible. Um, backporting LTS, yes, I said before, it's very complicated. I will give up on it, even if it's a security patch, but I will ask you, I will ask the author about it and we will work together on it. Um, some, if it is a security issue that I know about, I will usually do the work for you. Um, given there's, I mean, if you look at even Spectre Meltdown, we have people that cared about those old kernels. We did the work to get those merged. Um, we'll, we'll, we will do that. Don't worry about that. Um, if you're an author of those patches and it is a security issue and I tell you I didn't backport it and it needs to be backported, tell me and I will do that because I need to know that. Um, I lost my list. Okay, list. Um, Uh, you lift a challenge. I do not know anything about the you lift a challenge. Um, so email that site if you have questions about it. Sorry. Um, Linux over quantum computers. Quantum computers has a different processing model. Um, a quantum computer is hooked up to Linux. That's how what usually drives the quantum computer. So think of a quantum computer as a driver for a type of device, and Linux can control that very nicely. If you see what they're doing with quantum computers today, that's how they run them. Um, dum, dum, dum. If a contributor sends a patch for a specific board or chip, will the maintainer test it on the same platform? Sometimes not. I don't care. If you send me something that works for your platform, I will assume that you tested it on that platform. And if it doesn't break anybody else, I will take it because I have to trust you. If you sent something that obviously breaks it, then you're responsible and you have to fix it or I will revert it. Um, I don't have all the hardware for all the devices everywhere. so. We have to just read the code and know it, take it from there. And it usually works. Um, we do know this type of stuff and it can, is pretty obvious of what is happening. So don't worry too much about it. Um, we have to trust you. If you get it wrong, you got something wrong in public, but that's fine. It was your device. Um, do I think the 10 year plus kernel support like CIP makes sense? No, I don't. <laughs> I can go into that if people want me to, but I do not think that that makes very much sense. And this is speaking as somebody who maintains a kernel that's six years old. I do not think that makes sense either, but people have different business models. So it makes sense to those people with those business models. And that's wonderful. I don't have to agree with it because I'm not doing the work for them. It's fine. Linux is used in lots and lots of different places. I don't, might not agree with all those places it's used, but my goal is to give a tool that people can solve their problems with it. If a 10 year old kernel is solving a real problem for somebody, wonderful, I'm happy for them. Best of luck. Um, anything else? I think I kind of burned through those. I think I'm almost out of time. Um, anything else?
Okay, going once, going twice here. Well, thank you so much, Greg. Um, thanks for your time today. And thank you to everyone who participated and, and asked questions. Um, this recording will be on YouTube later today, and we hope you join us for future mentorship sessions. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day. Thanks.